Hello, everybody. Hi, um, I'm Catherine Dolan. Um, I'm the convener of the MA in Global Futures and Sustainability. Um, and today I'm going to provide you with a short introduction to the anthropology of sustainability. Uh, I'm going to begin by uh, sharing my slides here so that you can see where I'm going. Um, I hope everybody can see them. Um, if not, send uh, Rachel a note in the chat. Um, okay, so what I want to do here today is just provide you with a little taster lecture um, from the Anthropology of Sustainability module um, that I convene in the program. Um, and I just want to say, if you have any questions at all, please do feel free to ask them um, at the end of our session or to email me at any time. All right, so let me start by saying that, you know, today our planet contains 7.9 billion people with billions more likely to be added to our population by the end of this century. And we're also amidst this great number of people, we're a world that's divided between the very wealthy and the very poor. And we face unprecedented environmental challenges. Um, we're actively, as many of you know, changing the climate, what species survive on our climate, the chemistry of the ocean, the safety of the air, and the access and ability of fresh water for us to drink. Extreme storms, typhoons, floods, droughts, forest fires um, have become the new normal in our world. And even the democratic systems through which we purport to solve our dependence on fossil fuels are themselves premised on fossil fuel dependency. Now, these changes are so profound that geologists have given our current geological era a new name, the Anthropocene, to denote the role that human beings are playing or have played in changing the fossil and rock layers of the earth. Now, humans are not the only species that actually alter their environments. Others do too. As you can see here, beavers build dams affecting the hydrology of the area surrounding them. Birds build nests and coyotes dig dens, altering their environments in ways that increase their survival or the reproduction of the species as a whole, their reproductive success. Now, this is, this ability to alter the environment to facilitate the survival of a species is termed niche construction, or what the anthropologist Anna Singh calls species agilities. Now, as humans, we um, excel in niche construction. We don clothing to allow us to uh, live in very cold conditions, the same with insulated housing. Uh, we've constructed aqueducts, irrigation systems, wells and urban water supply pipes to provide the water that we need to survive, replacing drinking from streams or lakes. We have agriculture and refrigeration and transportation networks that allow us to eat all year round fresh fruits and vegetables. And we've developed health measures such as antibiotics and vaccines that limit the impact of disease as we've seen. So really human niche construction is an amazing thing, but human niche construction also takes a phenomenal amount of energy. And currently this energy, as again, as most of you know, is primarily consisting of fossil fuels. And these fossil fuels alter the global carbon cycle, leading to a buildup of CO2 and other greenhouse uh, gases in our atmosphere that cause local as well as global climate change. So one of the examples of this uh, is the way in which um, we've changed land use. For example, moving from small farms to large farms, from forests to parking lots, all contributing to an increase in the emission of greenhouse gases. Now land use change is a major driver of population extinction. In tropical areas alone, it was estimated that 1,800 species were lost each hour in the 1990s. 
Um, and according to Colbert, who has uh, done the work that you see here on the sixth mass extinction, um, he feels that we are uh, headed for what he calls this sixth mass extinction, an increase in the rate of species loss on a scale that's only occurred five times in the entire history of the earth. Now, while Homo sapiens are excellent in niche construction, it certainly has clear consequences for the climate, for species diversity, and for the landscapes we inhabit. Now, most of these consequences result from the growth-based market economies of the global north, in North America, Europe, um, as well as East Asia, that have intensified their resource extraction and consumption and externalized the costs of this onto the species and environments of the global south. And these, are, and these economies of the global north, um, really as well as many other places, but largely the global north, are based on two logics that anthropologists and sociologists have come to challenge. And the first is this logic of infinite growth. Um, and this is the way in which we take the idea of growth to be a natural, a given, an unquestioned and inevitable process. Now, this is a very powerful discourse. It's also an evolutionary one because it's based on the premise that through enhanced technological development, you know, um, less developed economies will grow into middle income economies, which will grow into highly um, developed economies or high income economies. So countries are placed on this sort of hierarchical scale as if one will become the than the other, the next on the latter, as a matter of default, right? Through, a, through this process of human progress and development. Now, this is one a logic that many are challenging today. Um, you know, we've seen it, uh, for example, in the degrowth um, movement, uh, the way in which the idea uh, of infinite growth is being problematized as one of the kind of key challenges and constraints we face to sub, uh, addressing climate change and its consequences. The second piece of the second logic here is this idea of um, the separation of humankind from nature. Now, while the idea of that humans are separate from the natural world has is, is kind of widely accepted. This is really a construction. In other words, it's a product of history of Judeo-Christian ideas where man was created separately from the natural world and had dominion over it. Now this belief, this conviction, this really this ideology has calcified over time. For example, in the birth of the scientific method by Francis Bacon during the Renaissance period, as well as in Adam Smith's theory of capitalism where nature was you know, valued solely because of its ability to satisfy human needs. This is in contrast to many indigenous cultures around the world where there's a familial relationship with nature, where nature is considered part and parcel of, uh, of a society of humans and the natural world working together. Plants and animals are actually relatives. So these two narratives of limitless growth and the separation of man and nature are powerful. They've allowed Western economies to destroy the non-human world for a very long time. And uh, they're premised on this idea of capitalism that sees the non-human world as resources that can be exploited for the human project. How else could we justify our food system, for example, if we didn't see cows and pigs as less than us, if we didn't see a division between the value we place on human life and the value we place on all other kinds of lives. If, for example, you were a believer in reincarnation uh, and you followed an Eastern religion, one of the Eastern religions, you, know, you or someone you loved uh, could one day be a cow. And this creates a very different understanding of food um, than if you see uh, animals as very distinct from yourself. 
So even our understanding of sustainability rests on these assumptions, these, ideolo these, these ideologies. Um, for example, the, um, the term sustainability was first articulated or used um, by this guy, Hans Karl von Karlowitz, um, who managed the mining on behalf of the Saxon court in Freiburg, Germany in the early 1700s. And while there were forest regulations at that time, the impact of timber shortages on Saxony's silver mining and metallurgy industries was devastating. And Karlowitz actually criticized the short-term thinking, and remember this was the 1700s, that was allowing more and more of the woodland in the area to be converted into fields and meadows. And he argued that wood should only be cut if they could be regrown through planned reforestation projects, very much ahead of his time. So this became an important guiding principle of what we know as forestry today. Later in the 19th and 20th centuries, we see how sustainability became twinned with conservation um, as the dominant approach to managing resources and the natural environment was one of protection, to protect them, protect, for example, uh, areas of forest um, and um, nature from capitalism's excesses. But this bifurcation, this separation between human beings and the natural world also is reflected in the international institutions that have adopted sustainability as a platform. For example, it was only in the 1970s when we saw environmental sustainability come on into the development arena for the first time as a concept that the UN Conference on Environment, on Human Environment, excuse me. So here we see also the first separation between the environment, the economy and develop and the society within the international development platform. Um, you know, and this has continued through various iterations of international declarations, international conventions, international uh, programs of work. Um, and as even in the 1992 UN Conference on Environmental Environment and Development, they put forth the Agenda 21, which acknowledged that sustainable development required attention to social, economic, um, and societal goals. Um, this is also a recognition that's found in the, in the 2015 sustainability de sustainable development goals, excuse me, which focus on economic development, social equity, and environmental protection. Now, we all think of this as a good thing because at least they're not ignoring the environment, at least they're not ignoring the economy, at least they're taking into account issues around um, inequality uh, and social justice and social development. But as the Human Rights Council just noted in their um, um, resolution pa uh, of, passed in uh, uh, November 2021, right around the time of COP, that there's a rec while there's now been a recognition of the holistic and indivisible nature of human rights and the environment, right? We now see that we can't separate these two things out. These it doesn't actually. Uh, it goes unheeded in global, regional, and national environmental and climate policy forums. In other words, we're still prioritizing one of these spheres um, instead of the other. Um, and there's been very little acknowledgement of how these three spheres interpenetrate inter and are mutually implicated. So for example, even the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, illustrate how achieving one aspect of the three dimensions can undermine the achievement of the other because you're not thinking of them as intertwined. The goal of eliminating poverty, for example, is in tension with the dominant approaches towards protecting territorial ecosystems, pitting conservation against economic development. So anthropologists often challenge these assumptions um, as sort of taken for granted ideas that are um, embedded in terms like sustainability, even development or progress or growth. 
um, and calling attention to the multiple meanings that can be embedded in a particular concept. So the concept of sustainability has been called an empty signifier. That is, that it's subject to radical di different interpretations and uses depending on who's actually uh, using the term. So we see a sustainable economy, sustainable resources, sustainable cities, sustainable agricultures, and so forth. It encompasses the movement towards smart and sustainable cities, the trend toward market environmentalism, and the pursuit of sustainable food practices, from community gardens to community-supported agriculture, to food that is local, slow food, organic, and fairly traded. Um, and it's deployed by a range of different actors, right? Including social enterprises, NGOs, corporations, municipal governments, international development organizations, multilateral organizations, nation states. And it even brings traditional antagonists together under the premise that they're all working towards the same goal of sustainability. Now this conceptual fuzziness anthropologists have shown is actually productive because it's the ambiguity of sustainability that allows it to be deployed unproblematically from the biggest of fossil fuel corporations to the greenest of NGOs, often allowing the status quo to be re reproduced um, while giving token attention to environmental and social issues. So one of the roles of anthropology is to question the narratives and the categories that define our worlds. So let me just finish this brief introduction by highlighting how anthropologists are conceptualizing and challenging um, ideas around climate change and um, arguing for a transition to a more sustainable world. First of all, we're trying to challenge the ideology of growth and progress that I spoke about. Now, this is difficult because we've all been taught in various ways to aspire, to grow, to progress, to do better and better. It's not only an individual, but a national and planetary narrative. But there's nothing inevitable about an economy premised on the idea of infinite growth. Some scholars and activists, as I mentioned, are advocating an alternative trajectory of degrowth, which rejects these assumptions of mainstream economic thinking and sees, um, seeks rather the shrinking of production and consumption as necessary for a democratic, just, and sustainable future. Uh, and certainly right now, there's all the more reason to challenge this idea of growth as we find ourselves in a hydrocarbon war where you know, we now have a moment given um, the um, illumination that's been played on our addiction to hydrocarbons to reconsider our, the way in which we grow our economy, uh, perhaps on a different footing of non-fossil fuels. Secondly, anthropologists call for examining how resources are distributed. Scarcities are not only generated through absolute limits, right, no more food, but through the unequal access to resources across dimensions of race, class, gender, ethnicity, geographic location. So disadvantaged groups often suffer disproportionately from um, any issue of climate change, experiencing what's called a double inequality. In and in fact, the term, the Anthropocene masks the fact that not all human beings have the same impacts on earth. Amazonian Indi Indians or Congolese hunter-gatherers, for example, have very different ecological impacts than we do here in Britain. Thirdly, we need to shift from this idea of value to values. Since industrialization, the value of nature has been equated solely with its value to people as humans extend control over species and the material world. This value um, means that uh, landscapes and species are increasingly seen as natural capital, valued in financial terms and exchanged in global markets. So we need to move away from solely this capitalist idea of value to a way to thinking about the way in which value connotes social justice, equality, and the common good. Fourth, we need to think beyond capitalism. 
Um, we've no, come to know capitalism as an economic and cultural system that continually spreads and bends societies to their own needs. Whether we're studying ecological disasters, pandemics, conflict and violence, capitalism is often seen to be the root of the problem. But when capitalism assumes such a determinant force, the only alternatives that we can envision are those possible given the realities of the class, the capitalist system. But anthropologists have shown the way in which people engage in non-capitalist activities, economic activities such as gifting and bartering and exchanging beyond markets, producing cooperatively, distributing collectively and democratically, interacting with one another and the natural world in ways that are not based on individual resource maximizing self-interest. Finally, um, the, um, it's important that we think about supporting diversity. Um, what we're seeing are the development of monocultures, uniformity, homogenization in our world. And we need to be thinking about what Arturo Escobar calls pluriversal struggles against capitalist accumulation, such as those put forth by indigenous groups, peasants, and landless movements. So instead of an idea of, of a global world in which we're all trying to fit into the same idea of progress and development together, we, would want, we want to see difference. We want to see how the struggles of the Zapatistas in Mexico can help us understand strategies for addressing climate change and, and the, the destruction of the earth. And finally, it's important for us here at SOAS um, to ensure that we're not just studying these issues, but that we're actually contributing to the solutions and to the, um, uh, the way in which they're addressed in both policy circles as well as among uh, wider publics. Anthropologists, um, we believe, get out of the classroom and think about the impact of their work um, on the wider publics and the wider world. So I'll just finish with this one slide because I think uh, it says, um, it kind of encapsulates what we hope to achieve through the MA in Global Futures. It's by Hem Henrietta Moore of, of the UCL's Global Prosperity Unit. In conceiving of a sustainable human future, we need to do more than think about who we have been and who we are. We need rather urgently to focus on the question of who we are hoping to become and how we are going to get there. Thanks for your attention. Thank you for that, Catherine. I'm sure everyone found that as uh, interesting as I did. Um, unfortunately, we had hoped that another academic would be joining us for sort of the other half of this session today, but I've just been told that they're not very well today. So oh our apologies there that um, unfortunately uh, they can't join us. But what I will do is pop um, their email address in the chat box and send this out to all of you so that if you did have any questions um, that you can sort of follow them up with her um, and also this might be a great opportunity if anyone does have any questions for Catherine that they uh, may want to also pop in the chat um, if they want to raise a hand I can also unmute you um, but perhaps about this module it could be about um, what Catherine was just talking about if you had any sort of follow-on questions that might be quite interesting um, or just about the course in general. Um, I'll just pop that in now. But yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to uh, also uh, contribute as well. Yeah, sure. If you guys have any questions or comments, um, please don't be shy. Uh, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions you have on the program or these topics or tell you a little bit about the courses that are the core courses of the program. Um, any kind of uh, questions that you might have, do feel free to fire them away. Is that somebody in the chat or is that for today? Oh wait. Oh, for for net for the 21-22. No, you mean the 22-23 academic year. Um, all our lectures right now are online and all tutorials are face to face. They haven't yet made a decision about what will happen in 22-23. I would imagine if the levels of, of COVID remain as they are now, we will be resuming face-to-face. -face. 
but with COVID, you just never know what's going to happen. So I would say stay tuned, keep in touch about that. Um, but I think at worst, it would be lectures online, tutorials face to face the way it is now. Um, what is the type of work that students go into this for? Oh, this is interesting because I run a um, kind of a seminar series, a professionalization series with the MA Global Future students. And just yesterday we had one. So um, the person that came works with the uh, Forest uh, People's Program on Indigenous, um, basically Indigenous rights, human rights in, in Latin America. Um, people have gone, this is our first year of the MA Global Futures and Sustainability, so I don't know where they're going to go on to, but it was pre previously we had an MA in the Anthropology of Development, so some of the kinds of uh, work in terms of environmental and um, um, social organizations, NGOs, international development, that people went on to work in through that program, I'm seeing that this current cohort is also interested in very similar types of work. Although uh, there's a few of them that are interested in, in working in, uh, I guess you would call it, um, yeah, maybe even biz business, but not, you know, not major corporations, but businesses that are working on adjusting to um, certain environmental regulations, thinking about how to introduce um, sustainability measures into their businesses um, and so forth. So I would say predominantly a range of international um, um, aid institutions, development organizations and NGOs, but with this new core, I'm seeing more into kind of, um, you know, research institutes, think tanks and, and, and businesses. Um, I'd like to know about the core modules of the Anthropology MA. Um, okay, so I'm talking about the MA in Global Futures um, and Sustainability. So this is different than the MA in Social Anthropology, but just for us, for MA of Global Futures and Sustainability, you take Anthropology of Sustainability in Term 1, you take um, uh, Anthropology of Climate Change, and anthropology on how to change things, of course, it, it but, um, focuses on how you move from these ideas to actually making change in the world in term two. Those are all, all those three are just your cohort. You also take ethnographic research methods. Um, you also take a theory course on anthropological theory. So you're required to take those five courses, and then you have three courses that you can. Um, that are known as options, which you can take in language or you can take um, in any other department. Each department has a list of option courses that they make available to people outside their department. How does SOAS connect education with activism with the school specifically? Um, well, there's a, couple, there's a couple of different ways this occurs. For example, I also um, teach on the MA in the Anthropology of Food. Um, we have a directed practical study where students are um, you know, we'll work with an organization, um, you know, for example, you know, a foraging organization in Northern London that's about protecting areas for, for uh, public foraging. And um, we also have a program in migration that students can do an internship on migration um, with an organization. Um, that obviously makes a, a clear connection between your academic work and your practice. Um, but I would also say, for example, in the Global Futures, we do have this course called How to Change Things, where there is an emphasis on advocacy and what you can do to actually um, make a difference in the world. Are there usually recordings of lectures even though they are held in person? Yes, every lecture is recorded. What are the main differences with the MA Global Purchase via the MSC Sustainable Development course? I think you, is it, is it MSC Sustainable Development in Development Studies? If you can let me know that. I don't know where the MSC Sustainable uh, Development is. But I mean, I think that they, we used to get a very similar course uh, question about what is the difference between the anthropology of development and development studies? Um, yes, it's in the development studies uh, department. And I think, I think the major difference between these courses is in the approach. I mean, anthropology is trying to understand, challenge, and somewhat problematize the way in which we understand the world and see the world that has led to particular outcomes, particularly with a focus on those who have been marginalized by processes of development or economic growth. 
Um, development studies is more apt to be a how to. This is this is what sustainability. Um, this is what sustainability means in various places. This is how you actually institute sustainability um, in various programs and practices. So I would say that if you development studies tends to take a more um, uh, uh, common common, if you will, common sense, accepted wisdom, orthodox approach to development, whereas anthropology would challenge and question how we've, we've come to the place we are. Um, again, anthropology is really focused on how people all over the world construct their worlds, construct their cultures. Um, you know, that is the focus of anthropology, the field work, um, the knowledge is generated through the process of field work. So you don't get that in development studies, not to say development studies is, isn't great, but it's a very different approach. How many mature students do you generally have? Um, uh, if you're looking at the anthropology of food, a lot. Um, anthropology of food, uh, perhaps maybe even half, um, maybe, a, well, maybe, maybe a third, maybe a third. Um, hard to know what constitutes mature exactly, but in the anthropology of food, we tend to have a lot of people that have been out there practicing, um, working, in, you know, whether it be in restaurants and pubs, in the food industry and policy, um, you know, the whole gamut, um, media. So they then come back to the MA anthropology of food to re to kind of reconnect the ideas that they've they've developed, uh, you know, by being out there in the world. Um, and connecting them with the kind of academic practice. Would you say the readings and thinkers studied within the school is diverse Southern and Northern thinkers? Absolutely. I mean, we've made a big, um, we had a big push and we're still in the midst of it to decolonize our curriculum and to decolonize the institution more broadly at SOAS. That is an, a principle upon which education is based at SOAS. And so, you know, you find in most courses that um, there, there's, you know, as much representation of people from the global south as the global north um, in order to kind of rectify the inequalities that, uh, you know, the asymmetries in knowledge production that have been evidenced in higher education. Oh, okay, that's Orchid Ed on it. What is the focus of the students? It's a very broad sense. Um, okay, so, um, it, I mean, I could say that um, just from the anthropology of sustainability module, um, we move from ideas around what sustainability is to um, issues in the Anthropocene and climate change to how particularly extractive industries have um, contributed to both our misreading of, uh, of the environment um, and society, but also uh, the devastation that has been wrought um, to the earth as a result of mining and fossil fuel extraction. Uh, we talk some, some about infrastructure, particularly water, um, water electricity infrastructure um, and the inequalities in accessing infrastructure, right? Efforts to make infrastructure more sustainable through greening the city, through green growth. Um, what else do we talk about? Oh, we talk about food and sustainability. Uh, we deal with indigenous communities and the way in which indigenous communities are fighting for uh, the protection of their land and resources. Uh, we look at alternative economies. In other words, we discuss what are the alternative trajectories um, that are available to rethink where we are now and how can we achieve that? That can be through you know, whether we're talking about deep growth campaigns, circular economies, um, green growth, uh, there's a variety of different sort of policy platforms that have been advanced in other, you know, to basically address the social and environmental uh, challenges we face. So we kind of, uh, you know, basically discuss those as a group and critique them and find our way through. So I'd say in a nutshell, what we're doing is really looking at kind of the uh, on the one hand, the problems we face in the world with an unsustainable environmental, social, and economic model. And then secondly, how those problems are experienced in different places around the world, right? So that you get a, a, a broad perspective from anthropologists who have worked in the global south as well as the global north. And then the third part of the course is focused on, okay, so what do we do about all this?
Are BAs required or desired for this study? What BAs? No BAs are required or desired. Um, you don't need to have a BA in anthropology and um, in, we accept all BAs. So there's no um, specificity there. What is website I can search more about the article Anthropology of Social wrote by lecture? I'm really interested in anthropology through Evan. What, what is website I can search more about the article? So you want to know, um, you want to read an article that um, somebody at SOAS has written. Um, if you go to uh, our department and you hit, um, you, you press the toggle for, um, um, I think it's faculty or staff. It's one of those um, people, you know, um, and then we all have our individual profiles there. And then you can hit the tab for, press the tab rather, sorry, um, publications. And under publications, you will see a list of the publications by each of the lecturers. If you're interested in one of them and you can't get access to them, do feel free to contact that lecturer to get uh, uh, directly. Um, saying that you're interested in their work or, you know, you could contact me and I can see if I can help you to find it. So when you mentioned working with Indigenous, which community have a chance to get with students and hearing them? No, I think that um, SOAS offers, we don't, we do not, I didn't want to clarify that. Um, as part of the anthropology department, we do not connect you directly with different Indigenous communities. We have a small dissertation grant, small, uh, it's not even, that allows you to do research for your MA dissertation, um, but that entails you identifying your own contacts and making arrangements for your own field work. We provide advice, we provide support, um, we provide in some cases connections and um, you know ideas about how you could access different networks in the global south because we're an institution with lots of connections to the global south um but in terms of uh, a sort of an, a, a program in which you are assigned you are given the opportunity to work with a specific indigenous community we don't run that kind of internship program we're more like um brokers were more in the sense of facilitating your connection with places rather than making that happen for you. I hope that makes sense. Okay, lovely. We don't have any more questions. I think we can uh, <clears throat> wrap it up a little early there. Well, I think we've got another one that's just come in. I have a BSc in ecology and generally I'm actually going to be putting a list of uh, readings that I'm going to suggest uh, for people that are ex that are accepted into the program and want to do a little bit of pre-reading. Um, I mean, if you have a good sense of climate change and sustainability, I'm not sure that um, you know the the book by. Brightman, the anthropology of sustainability uh, would be that useful to you. Um, and I might suggest that um, you focus more on the social and human sides of, of sustainability. In other words, how are uh, people in the global south conceptualizing uh, their world? Um, and that might be of more help for you than more sciencey stuff. Um, you could contact me directly at CD17 at SOAS. I'd be happy to send you a few things that um, that you could that you could might find interesting. Can this be approached via art and communities? Uh, I guess you mean your dissertation. Um, you can do your dissertation can be focused on uh, you know really anything that is related to sustainability. It's very much a broad church. Um, you can include graphics, films, and things in your dissertation, but as a present, the dissertation still exists in the narrative form. In other words, you would still have to write a dissertation, even though you could include, um, you know, different artistic representations in your dissertation. So I guess I'm answering that from two different vantage points. One is you could look at art and sustainability as part of your as a focus of your dissertation project, but you wouldn't be able to, for example, uh, submit a painting as in lieu of your dissertation. However, you could, you know, include 
photographs of paintings or images of paintings in it as part of a wider narrative form. Okay, I think okay. that's it for now. Okay. Thank you, you again. Have for my um, my uh, email address is. I'll just pop it in. Yeah, here. maybe pop that in the chat. Um, I can see there's one last question that's come in about internship opportunities. Um, so maybe Catherine, if you wouldn't mind finishing with that query, um, okay. just while you're typing that in, I will plug a session that we have coming up. So if anyone has any remaining questions or they want to talk to anyone uh, from the recruitment team, then we will have a session on the 13th of April. It's a live chat session and we will be emailing you about it. So today this session was recorded um, and we'll also be emailing you with the recording of that so you can re-watch it, review it. And if you do have any remaining questions, um, either specifically about the course, then um, do get in touch with Catherine, uh, or if it's anything to do about your application or, or sell us more broadly, uh, then you can come along to that session and, and ask our team as well. Um, so yeah, Catherine, if you wouldn't mind just quickly talking about internship opportunities, um, I think we'll then leave it there. I was mentioning before that we have an, in, an internship um, opportunity in the MA Anthropology of Food and in the MA Migration Studies, um, which is interdisciplinary, not anthropology. Um, uh, those are the two formal uh, internship opportunities that we have. We are, as I mentioned earlier, we this is the first year that we've run the Global Futures and Sustainability MA. So we currently don't have an internship program. Um, we are looking to develop one along the lines of the MA Anthropology of Food. I doubt that will be 22, 23. It may be, but it's it's it may not be. Um, and I did mention also that we have a course called How to Change Things, which is based on um, advocacy um, and um, taking your educational um, learnings into the real world of practice. So it's not an internship, but it's similar to, uh, I mean, it has a practice focus, I should say. Okay, lovely. Well, thank you again for everyone who joined us today and Catherine for her time. Um, and we hope to be seeing some of you at SELAS very soon. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>